Hi, everyone. I'm Jillian Kay. I'm a junior broadcast journalism major. I'm here with... Hi, everyone. I'm Wesley Days. I am also a junior journalism major, and we're so delighted to be here, Jillian, with President Gilligan. Thank you so much for sitting down with us this, this, after, this beautiful morning, I should say. Yeah, thank you. It's my great pleasure. I made, made sure the weather was going to be nice for thank this morning. Thank you. You cleared <laughs> the skies for us, and we can see all of Boston behind us. That's so great. So Absolutely. we really just have a few questions for you, just to talk about the college and see where we're going as a people in a community. Absolutely. Yeah. And I'll start with our first one here, Absolutely. Wesley. President Gilligan, how have things returned to a normal state here on campus? How are Emerson students be continuing to be innovative? You know, when I look back on, on 2020 uh, and all that we had to deal with, I think about innovation all the time because all of us were innovators. Uh, you know, the word of the year in 2020 was pivot. Uh, we all pivoted. And in doing so, we faced a new direction. We faced new challenges, but we kept our goals intact. And that's the, that's the the definition of innovation to keep your to keep your goals intact, but to but to find different ways to uh, to get where you wanted to go, we had to provide uh, new safety mechanisms for for everybody. You know, we we uh, we de-densified the campus. We we spent resources on on that. We we spent resources on uh, on enhancing technology as we all as we all moved uh, into uh, an online world. And then from, from that, coming back into a, a more hybrid world uh, and trying to, find, trying to find what everybody refers to as a new normal. Now our challenge is to continue the innovation that we were forced into. Learn more from what we learned uh, during the pandemic uh, to find that new way of doing things. Because we are faced in another direction. Uh, we're never going to face the way we were. I think we're going to show uh, ourselves that the resourcefulness and the resilience that, that we demonstrated uh, can propel us into that, into that new normal with, with new ways of, uh, of getting things done, new, way, new modes of, uh, of teaching, new modes of learning. Uh, and I think it's exciting. Uh, you know, when I think about what the pandemic forced us to do, uh, you know, in a way, uh, it, it forced us to think about the, the future in, in exciting ways, and, uh, and I, you know, I, I think it's going to be great. Well, kind of going off of what, one of the things you said, you know, you talk about how the pandemic kind of pushed us to, to move forward, to look at ourselves in a new way, and to, to look at the learning process in a completely different light. And so. Um, I want to talk about diversity and inclusion because that is also something that the pandemic forced us to look at a little bit harder. And it's also been a conversation here at Emerson for quite some time. And so my question to you is, how are we really doing in this area? What are, what are we trying to do to propel us forward um, in the diversity and inclusion area and making sure our community is inclusive and very diverse and making sure it looks like our nation? The pandemic... Uh, forced us to to face in new directions, but it also forced us to face realities, because what the pandemic did uh, was exacerbate some disparities that existed between you know the, the people of privilege, people with great great means, uh, as opposed to people whose uh, whose socioeconomic status didn't didn't allow them to to feel comfortable uh, working from home, studying from home. Uh, you know, you live in a multi-generation, uh, small household, uh, and everybody's trying to work and study from home. It's, uh, it, it's well nigh impossible to, uh, uh, to, to concentrate. So we, we recognize that. And one of, one of the things I'm proud to say is that even, even in, the, in the pandemic, with all the costs that we face, Emerson never lost sight of the, uh, of, of the need to continue to address uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion more aggressively. Uh, in fact, uh, we've increased, even during the pandemic, when, when we had all the cost-cutting measures, we were able to increase funding uh, for scholarships aimed, aimed at diversity, equity, and inclusion, uh, including the, uh, the creation of uh, a Dean's Fellowship Program in which uh, in which 17 students get grants to uh, 
to, to help advance the conversation uh, in the various uh, schools and departments on, uh, on issues of uh, diversity and inclusion. We also have a, a uh, circle of creative scholars that, uh, that's aimed at, uh, at the populations that, that have been socioeconomically uh, disadvantaged, in which there's 10 full scholarships uh, that that will be that will be given that are going to help advance our uh, our issues of diversity. Uh, in addition to that, uh, we've done some reorganization around what we call student success. We don't want people falling through the cracks. You know, we, we want to make sure that we're that we're that we're capturing problems uh, early. We want everybody who comes to Emerson. Uh, to feel good about their place here and to uh, and to and to be successful and to graduate uh, so student success is a, is a really important uh, part of uh, part of our efforts I'm happy to say too that uh, that we're in the final stages of a selection process for a campus leader uh, to be the vice president for equity and social justice I'm hoping that we have uh, that we have a person in place uh, relatively soon uh, and even though I'm an interim president, uh, the college has decided that it's really important to fill that position uh, as expeditiously as we can. So I appreciate you sharing that. Uh, and you mentioned finances as well. It's very impressive that we've been able to give out about 10 more scholarships um, with diversity and inclusion at the forefront. But while we're on the topic of finances, with the pandemic, obviously, the college has lost a little bit of revenue um, due to COVID testing, supplies and technology, working to build that here. So how is the college now working to build back financially? We did have significant losses in revenue when the pandemic started. We, we had to forego $32 million of revenue and it cost, in the first stages of the pandemic, it cost us $14 million to do the mitigation, to, do, to, to get testing programs started, to do the de-densification that we did on the campus. And we continue to have, uh, have very significant costs with respect, to, uh, with respect to testing. But in all that, uh, we, we have tightened the belt. We've recognized that that the world out there isn't uh, isn't at the point where where it was with respect to people's ability in general to to pay for the cost of higher education. So even as we've we've had to increase our costs, we've done it in a in a very judicious way. We have lowered the rate at which we've increased tuition traditionally. But even as we've increased tuition in a modest way, we have created a tuition uh, cost offset program, which means that any student currently enrolled uh, who, has the, who has the demonstrated need doesn't have to pay the increase uh, that, that comes with those costs. For the long term, however, what we have to do is recognize that Emerson is tuition dependent and we have to do better with respect to, to fundraising and building our endowment. That's not something that can happen overnight, but, but with the goodwill of, of, our, of our alumni, with outreach to, with, to foundations, corporations, uh, et cetera, we have a plan to, uh, to, to really gear up the fundraising of Emerson College to build the endowment, to make us less tuition dependent uh, for the future. But that's a, that's a long-term goal. That's perfect. And, you know, as we turn to final thoughts here, you know, Jillian and I as students, and I think you can agree with this, that Emerson is a place where we're very mindful of our present, but we're still very directed towards our future. And so, um, as interim president of Emerson, um, where do you see us going and what do you see for us in the future? What a great question. Uh, you know what? I, I spent more than 37 years here uh, before I returned to be the interim president. 
And what I saw over those 37 years was, was incredible transformation. Uh, we, there's, no, there's no building on our campus that, that used to be an Emerson building when I started here. The, the, the whole campus moved uh, completely. The, the quality of the faculty, the quality of, uh, of our student body, selectiveness rating, uh, of the college as it's measured by, as it's measured by uh, people who do those things, uh, have been uh, on, on upward facing arrows ever, ever since I got here. So, I, and I, I think that, I think that we're on a launch pad for, for even greater success. Emerson is a special place. There's no place that's like it. Uh, we have a, uh, we have a niche that, that has protected us uh, through the pandemic. As you yourselves uh, know, there, there are very few places you can go to get what you got at Emerson. Uh, and we need to nurture that. We need to celebrate it. We need to tell the world. We need to do a better job of telling people uh, how great Emerson is. Emer as good a college as Emerson is in communication, we need to do a better job of communicating about the place. Uh, so for the future, uh, I have a, uh, I have a, a rosy picture in my mind for where for where Emerson is going. Uh, I'm proud uh, that that the college asked me to come back to to lead it in an interim way, and my fond hope is, is that uh, for for my time here, uh, I do the I do the best job I can to to make sure that the the, the road ahead is is well paved. And even widened uh, a little bit for for uh, for more people, for, for more for more resources, et cetera. Yes. President Gilligan, I we can't thank you enough yes. for sitting down with us today. Thank no, you so it, much. it's my pleasure. You you make me proud. <laughs> thank, well, thank you. Thank you. Hi, you're here. We love that you're the kind of person who shows up to stuff. We're guessing that means you enjoy reconnecting with the people you went to school with which is why we think you, of all people, will be into this. Emerson has an exciting platform called Emerge, the private online community where Emersonians can connect, support, and celebrate each other. In Emerge, you can explore opportunities in your industry, reconnect with old friends, make new connections, promote your work, share resources, be a mentor, or find one. Join us at emerge.emerson.edu. Hi, I'm Whitney Phillips, and I have a confession. This is my second take of this video for reasons that are immediately connected to what it is I'm talking about in this talk. So I'll explain how and why, um, but the fact that I needed to come back and record it again, because in the first version, I was very stressed out and frazzled. That's actually a part of what I am talking about. So, so what I'm gonna be talking about is what we end up missing when we focus on problems related to false information on social media. And false information on social media is obviously a problem, but true information can be a problem too. And reflecting on how and why allows us to open the conversation up to broader issues of wellness and mental health. So I approach this issue through the lens of information pollution, which has a whole range of benefits. So first, unlike mis or disinformation, which both require you to determine whether a false claim was shared on purpose or on accident, information pollution as a concept isn't tethered to someone's motive. It's tether tethered to the broader environmental consequences of the information. So both immediately and when it's, both immediately when it's shared and downstream. So a quick rhetorical point, I use lots of environmental metaphors in my work when talking about information because I want to highlight interconnection and consequence and how we personally fit within and contribute to our networks, which was all the focus of my most recently published book in 20, 2021. That's the one. What year is it? I don't remember. So back to polluted information. So 
In addition um, to sort of sidestepping motive, it also highlights the environmental justice elements of the discussion, namely how harm online is unequally distributed across groups. The minoritized groups are so much more likely to be poisoned where they live, live, work, and play on social media, just as they are offline. So pollution sort of helps us think about those kinds of consequences. And a pollution frame also allows us to more thoughtfully consider how we all can pollute simply by going about our day-to-day -day lives. It's not just the industrial polluters or the people who actively set out to pollute and harm that can have an enormous effect on the landscape. We do too, often just by going about our everyday business, even when we're trying to help. And information pollution as a concept is helpful in another way too. And that's to point out two very important, very different kinds of pollution, which will also allow me to sort of loop back to how wellness and mental health issues are actually really critical to media literacy efforts. So first you have information that's polluted. So it's toxic in and of itself because it's false, because it's harmful, because it's misleading. And this is the kind of information that's most closely aligned with the terms mis and disinformation. It tends to be the thing that, that people worry about the most and talk about the most when they are engaging with our current political hellscape. I mean, landscape. Oh, that joke didn't quite work out, but it's all right. Should I try that again? Should I just let it be? Here's how it was supposed to sound. Well, that's annoying to redo it. Leave it in, it's fine. Look, look, we're all people here. I was going to say, when talking about our current political hellscape, I mean landscape. I think I even mispronounced it that time. So apparently the joke was just not meant to be. Okay. So in addition to information that's polluted, you have information that's polluting. It isn't necessarily bad information at all. It can be true information. It can be good information, but still it fills people's brains with sludge when there's too much of it, or it pushes people into a state of overwhelm. So let's pause there for just a second. Over the last 15 years, since I'd started my PhD in 2008, my research focus has been in a nutshell, everything that's terrible on the internet, yay. Issues of mental health and wellness were always central in that work because doing the work hurt my mental health and wellness. It's something that I mostly failed to understand and definitely paid the price for in the first few years of the work. I didn't have any theories surrounding this connection, but by the time I published my first book in 2015, here's that cover, I'd internalized how are you doing as a basic media literacy question. And I brought that sensibility into my classrooms, especially as each year kept being the worst year, impossible to top in its chaos and weirdness, and then inevitably would be topped. And a pattern very quickly emerged in conversations with students. The worse they felt, the more overwhelmed they were, the more their sharing tended to be knee-jerk and reactive and almost desperate in the effort to feel like they were doing something or anything to fix things or simply to distract themselves. And the frequency with which I encountered this pattern only intensified as COVID crept on the scene. So I was deeply unsurprised when I started to encounter studies published during the pandemic, zeroing in on the link between overwhelm, information overload and problematic social sharing. This work was specific to social media, but it's also pretty standard brain stuff. Neuroscience research has long highlighted the relationship between overwhelm and diminished attention and diminished emotional regulation. Basically, more stress means fewer cognitive resources. Fewer cognitive resources means less perspective. Less perspective means more problems when people are speaking from a reactive place. And of course, when they're sharing on social media from a reactive place. Stressed out sharing tends not to be particularly good or healthy sharing. Instead, it easily locks a person into cycles of doom scrolling and associated doom sharing, as if the act of posting or commenting or texting were a kind of emotional purge of the bad feelings that kept bubbling up. And that's bad enough when individual people feel terrible, but that terribleness is often contagious when our maybe misleading, maybe misinformed, maybe totally accurate, just too much, too annoying, too noisy reactive sharing 
in turn sends others into the same reactive state and pushes them to overshare, uh, overpost, and in many cases to overreact. So back to a real life human moment. While I was recording the first version of this quick talk, I started getting, I mean, I made a mistake and I did not silence my phone, but my phone started going off in the background and it wasn't just one ping. It wasn't just two. The person who was reaching out to me, they must've pinged me seven times. So I'm trying to record this talk. One happens, that's bad enough. Then it's two, then it's three, then it's four. And suddenly just like that, I found myself jumping into exactly that sort of reactive state that I was describing here. And I jumped up and I stomped over to my phone and I, you know, yelled at the phone to shut up. Um, and then when I came back down to, to finish my talk, I couldn't, I, I really had a hard time sort of getting back into this zone of like saying my words, which is exactly what I'm talking about using my words. So it happens to all of us all the time, you know, in this weird overlap between what happens on social media, even if you and you should count text messaging or offline and all the ways that those, those two spaces overlap. So I call the kinds of cycles that I engaged in as I was recording this talk about the thing I was just doing, I call those cycles pollution chain reactions. And to be clear, both kinds of information pollution, so either polluted or polluting, can trigger pollution chain reactions. But we typically don't worry about polluting information, especially when it's true information, even though it can actually do just as much damage or be just as disruptive, but insidiously so, because that's just not a category that tends to be discussed in traditional media literacy discussions. People are more worried about stuff that's false. And so then they're not thinking about or talking about, reflecting on, what about the information that's true? So the relationship between information and our inner lives, in a nutshell, how what we're sharing is fundamentally tethered to how we're doing, is a critical and typically under-discussed, as I just mentioned, factor in our information ecosystem broadly. Whether we're talking about media liter literacy or not, people are generally not talking about how we're feeling when they're talking about our informational woes. And focusing more of our attention there is one of the main strategies I advocate for when considering, okay, we clearly have a problem. Now what do we do about it? And there are other strategies too, which I lay out in my forthcoming book, early 2023, called Thinking Ecologically about social media, co-authored with Ryan Milner and written with teenaged readers in mind. Unfortunately, there's no book cover to show just yet. There will be. And the goal of that book is to cultivate more calm in ourselves and our immediate networks in the effort to minimize the kinds of pollution chain reactions we end up contributing to. So here's a, here's a very quick sort of um, overview of some of the strategies that that book engages with. So first we need to pay attention to our bodies and offer ourselves care when we feel ourselves becoming reactive, like when someone keeps text messaging us, even though it was actually our fault for not silencing our phones. So in my experience, mindfulness-based mindfulness stress reduction techniques um, are, are key, and there's a lot of space to do more research in that area. And we also, in addition to offering care to ourselves, paying attention to ourselves and then offering care to what we need, we also need to offer care to others by checking in with what they need and by employing active listening and de-escalation strategies to, to avoid jumping to conclusions about what we think we are seeing or hearing online, which we are very often wrong about. And finally, we need to maintain healthy boundaries with the people we care about. And maintaining healthy boundaries is the strategy that I'll close with. And there are a number of ways that you can maintain those boundaries online and off with a particular need online where so much of our misunderstanding and stress and excessive pinging happens. But one of the favorite of these tips um, and which I use in my own life is a green, yellow, red check-in code. So I use that when I first start chatting live with someone, whether it's over text or FaceTime or the phone. And the code works like this. You make real-time contact with someone. You then ask them what color they are. And if they say green, you can start talking about whatever, just jump right into it. 
if they say yellow, let them know what you want to talk about and see if they have time or the emotional resources to discuss whatever it is. And if they say red, you just tell them to message you when you can and then say goodbye. And you can use any code that you would like that indicates I'm available, I'm a little bit busy, or I can't talk. I just happen to like green, yellow, red because of stoplights, I guess. Now, this code is meant for everyday situations, not emergencies. If something terrible happens or if, if a person is in crisis, the green, yellow, red distinction matters much less. But for day-to-day -day chatting, this code is all about maintaining healthy boundaries. It allows another person to communicate their needs to you and prevents you from accidentally making someone else feel trapped and resentful, which is a very common first stage of a pollution chain reaction, which happened on camera um, just a little bit ago. So the big question, will something like a green, yellow, red check-in code or any other tip or strategy designed to help us feel better in our relationships? Is that gonna magically solve our informational and political woes? Of course not, no. Individual actions aren't enough and they will never be enough to rebuild our dysfunctional information systems. But our everyday actions influence what those informational systems are pumping out for better and for worse. We all know what the worse is like, but what about the better? What if we could find a way to cultivate more calm, more well-being, more care, so that we all have more space and freedom and choice to respond to the challenges that lie before us rather than knee-jerk reacting to everything or simply just disengaging and running away screaming because that feels safer? That could be a game changer in terms of civic engagement, in terms of democracy, in terms of rebuilding trust across differences. And all starting with the deceptively simple question, how are you? So thank you very much. Take care of yourselves and each other. What does it mean to make it big? It kind of depends on who you ask. But one thing's for sure, there isn't just one way to do it. In each episode, you'll meet an Emersonian who's making it, making a living, making a difference, and sometimes making it up as they go along. Join us for Making It Big in 30 Minutes, a podcast for, by, and about the Emerson community and the many ways its alumni are making the world a little better every day. Visit emerson.edu slash alumni for more information. And be sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you like to listen. Welcome everyone, my name is Wes Jackson. I'm the director of the Business of Creative Enterprises program, better known as the BCE here at Emerson College. And I'm gonna talk about three things and I'm gonna answer three questions. The first question is why, the second question is why, and the third question is why. Because in the BCE, that's what we focus on, is what, is what is your why? Why are we here? Why do we exist? Why do we bring value? And why does the marketplace as a whole need us? So the, the first question, uh, what, what I want to explain to people about the BCE uh, that I often get from parents, alumni, uh, old executives that I've dealt with sort of uh, back down in Brooklyn is, why is there a business program at Emerson College? Why it does it make sense? If people want to study business, they should go, you know, maybe stay home at NYU or Babson, uh, other great institutions, Syracuse, uh, a little bit up further north. Um, but why is it here? It doesn't make sense. This is a place about art and film and theater and journalism. You don't fit. And I say to them, exactly. That's why we, we're here. Because we don't fit because business programs that are up and running and been up and running for uh, generations, are back, are, are, they don't have it right. They are struggling to adapt into a time that because we come from a school of creatives and artists that is native to us. And when I say this thing uh, native, I had a student, uh, one of my student assistants who graduated last year, Kristen uh, Kawog, one of the most brilliant minds that I've, uh, young minds I've ever encountered, 
we were having a meeting, and she said, you know, they call my generation digitally native, right? They grew up on the phones, Instagram, Snapchat, and supposedly, right, old dinosaurs like me don't have to learn that where they were born into it. But what Kristen said to me is that we're all, we're inclusive by uh, nature, by design. That they came into this world of pronouns and gender identities and Black Lives Matter and Me Too. And you just cannot underestimate what that, um, what that means to a young person, right? That we're going to start respecting your self-identity and the, the true self from the beginning, um, as opposed to me, a black man from the Bronx who spent most of my academic and, and, and significant parts of my professional career proving to the them that I had value, that I was a human even to some. But at the BCE, we're business people who understand that this need for diversity, equity, and inclusion, if it's just checking a box, you're going to fail. Because the current marketplace, more than it's not, is demanding of it. So this world where we have to understand how we talk to people of a different gender, a different sexual identity, that maybe a big corporation, say, you know, a Ford or a Chevrolet or, or maybe even a Google has to deal with. Who has been living in an industry where we've had to be more tolerant and accepting of different identities, different nationalities, different faiths than the creative industry. We seem odd as a business program in an art school. I would argue is that the business world is coming to us, right? They're understanding that when you allow more people into the tent and you begin to not look past race or past gender or faith or geography, but welcome it, what will be the output will be a superior product. That is what manufacturing and the government and uh, accounting firms are realizing. But in this building, this has been the case. So these boxes that people are trying to check, we grew up there. We live there. And we are negotiating from that point forward with our young executives and leaders. The second why is uh, why, are, why are we necessary? Why do we bring value? I get oftentimes students, particularly first years, uh, come into my office, or I'll have a class, BC 110, one of our, our introductory classes, say, what industry are you interested in? What do you want to do? What do you want to be in life, right? That existential question. Until I tell them it's a trick question. Because what is, it's, you should not feel the pressure to pick one. The silly question is, why are you asked to pick one? You were only 17, 18, 19, 20 years old, even non-traditional students who are changing their lives. Why pick one? Who said pick one? You are no longer being rewarded for being one. We live in a time of convergence uh, of businesses where you can have someone like, uh, uh, my background is in hip hop and uh, hip hop culture and history. So I think about, say, a Rihanna, who incredible song, you know, songwriter, performer, dancer, all of this executive, sells millions of records and they say, you know what I want to do? I want you to start a health and beauty uh, uh, company. And Rihanna says, I, say less. Makes total sense to me. So you go up the mountain one way and, right, in American capitalism, you should just keep going up, I guess, ad infinitum. But in what we're realizing is you go up, over, and then back up. So now Rihanna has makes more money off of Fenty than she ever did from her Def Jam contract. But is, isn't Rihanna a singer and a performer? Yes, in an obvious sense, but in just the same equal obvious sense, absolutely not. Rihanna is a force of nature. Beyonce, forces of nature. Lady Gaga, they're sort of forces of nature that happen, we happen to interact with that energy when those women were deciding to communicate their energy through the medium of music or uh, live events. But unbeknownst to everybody, the world, right, the universe, the marketplace, whatever macro system you want to think about, always wanted Rihanna to move laterally and then up. Because what does Fenty make so much money from? The, the wonderful idea that she realized that women have different shades, that there are different complexions of women out there who never realized that, said nobody. It was always right in front of this. But a Rihanna who's seeing this 
aunt, multiracial, multigenerational uh, audience in front of her for, t for 10, 15 years says, uh, I want to cater to them. And the music has gone far enough, but I want to do more. So it converges. All right? So you have, uh, you know, uh, uh, again, I'll, I'll just be using hip-hop references because that's who I am, right? Jay-Z is, is a rapper, right? An MC, a writer, but now he owns a streaming service, right? Now has pieces of Twitter. Up and over, it converges because if I'm Twitter, if I'm Jack Dorsey and I want to stay relevant, who do I call another social media exec that's graduated from, I don't know, Kellogg School of Business? Or do I call the biggest cultural force of nature, to use that word again, in popular culture? You tell me which one makes the most sense. And because all of these creatives have to be diverse in their thinking, the pivoting from industry to industry is actually very, very easy. So I go back to say, what is it about the BCE? We ask you that question as a setup. I want you to say film, TV, music, fashion, and gaming. And then say, and then I want them to come west. I don't know how all that works. So now let's begin. Now let's get started. Because everybody who's telling you that they have it all figured out, I personally believe they're full of it. Because I'm 48 years old. I've been working for almost 30 years. I've raised millions of dollars, hired hundreds of people, and hundreds of people, and I don't really know what's going on. And that's a good thing. Stay curious. Because the moment you think you have it figured out is when the market's going to punch you right in the face. So I want my, my student, I want our students, our shared students, to stay, stay curious. So I think about something I say to parents is always a bad dad joke, because I do dad jokes, uh, to always enlighten the room, is peanut butter and tuna fish. Has anybody had, ever had a peanut butter and tuna fish sandwich? And everybody's like, ew, yuck, Wes, what are you talking about? I said, OK, who likes peanut butter? Raise your hand. Hands go up. Who likes tuna fish? Raise your hand. So theoretically, everybody likes these ingredients. And then I say, all of you guys, you say you hate the peanut butter and tuna fish sandwich. Who here has ever had a peanut butter and tuna fish sandwich? Nobody. So you're making assumptions based on something that has never really happened. It's logical, right? A peanut butter and tuna fish sandwich is not what I'm going to go get from the dining center uh, this afternoon, right? I'm no dummy. But I come from a world where we're living in a peanut butter tuna fish world. Because these little boxes, I don't know where they are, but when you go into my office, you see these little Wi-Fi boxes everywhere. And I realized that these three young men who are behind these cameras, that's probably how you've enjoyed music your entire life, right? Record stores, Tower Records, HMV, these are just relics of the past. So you're telling me that most people are consuming music through invisible signals that come from, uh, from the ceiling into a rectangular black box, and you have 30 million options. Tell me that's not a peanut butter and tuna fish sandwich. Because I'm a music business guy. I know when Napster was founded down the block and record, sta record labels started going under, some people said, we need to embrace the idea that the delivery mechanism for music will be through these zeros and ones. Peanut butter and tuna fish, that's nasty. It'll never work. And now I don't, all those people working for UPS right now. I don't know where they are. But if you do not at least entertain the peanut butter and tuna fish sandwich, you're not going to get any further. If you want to stay locked in old systems, how can you make new money? So we want you to stay curious. So now a peanut butter and tuna fish sandwich may be na nasty, but maybe grilled tuna with a peanut reduction sauce. Now I might charge you $60 for that plate. Right? So we take those raw ingredients, those curiosities, and we refine them in the program. And that's what gives us great strength. And, and the last point I'll say before I get to my third point is everybody that I've always admired has had five or six careers. Start with my father, Hudson Jackson, who was an IT executive before that wasn't the word. He's 82 years old. And he'll call me up and say, I'm, I think I'm going to get into vertical farming in the backyard. And I'm saying, man, you, you've had three careers, three retirements, three pensions. Will you just stop? And he says, well, when you stop, you die. And I'm not ready to go yet. Stay curious. So we want you to keep pushing those things and, 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 and merge them together. Uh, Sean Combs, Puffy, Diddy, Love, whatever you want to call him, is now a billionaire off of vodka. I knew him as a dancer and as a rapper, as a producer. Then he became a music exec, then a TV exec, then an actor. And now he's in vodka. So don't tell me that you need to stay in one thing. 
the market does not support that statement. The last point I want to say is, why does the world need the type of executives and scholars that we're producing in the BCE? Um, some of you have made, I imagine some of you are watching this, and, and, and maybe some folks in the room have read the book, The Alchemist. Um, and I read that book, um, again, because of another rapper, uh, Everything is Hip Hop with me, uh, Jay Electronica, referenced it in the lyric, and I said, I think I'd, I've heard about that book, I never did it. Now I read it uh, after New Year's, every year, just to refresh my thoughts. But quite frankly, what The Alchemist says is, you know, once you tap into your inner power, you're, you, you can accomplish tremendous things. Plus, there's always people trying to take you off of that path. But The Alchemist, in sort of uh, medieval or uh, typical literature, turns base metals into, gold, into precious metals, lead into gold. But what The Alchemist says, and I won't ruin the book for people who, who may still um, uh, hope you go, go read it, is that's just the visible. That's what the public sees of my power. It's a simple thing that they can monetize, but that's not my true power. The true power of an alchemist is taking nothing and turning it into something, right, in all of its ways. That's what creatives do. The nothing is just the thought in your head, the dream you had last night, the daydream on the T train, on the orange line, or when I go back home on the C line, that's nothing and you put in the hard work, and you get the tools, you learn the rules of the game, you learn the language, you build your network, and that nothing turns into something. And one of the things that in my life I did uh, was an event called the Brooklyn Hip Hop Festival, which me and my wife ran for 15 years. And people always, oh, how did you do this, Wes? And it's amazing, and I was on the gym. I was in the gym on the Stairmaster or the elliptical, stressed out because I was about to have my first child. And in that moment, that lightning bolt hit. We need a world-class festival for hip-hop culture in Brooklyn like they do for the New Orleans Jazz Fest. And because I was in touch with my power, I took that and turned it into something that has attracted, you know, Jay-Z, Kendrick Lamar, uh, uh, Tribe Called Quest, and all, all of my favorites. But we really are magicians as creatives. We are turning nothing into something. We're doing it right now. Someone somewhere had an idea that for expressions, this would be a great idea to communicate with our alumni, and we are literally doing it. But at some point, it was nothing. So we teach in the BCE to refine that power, uh, institutionalize, operationalize that power, and execute that power, and ultimately respect that power. So we are, we are training Jedis here to do good in the world put good out into the world to further the conversation. Because in this world um, that now uh, sexual abusers, uh, sexual predators against women are being uh, arrested and, and prosecuted and jailed. Uh, when cops who murder men uh, in the street are being jailed, uh, arrested, jailed, arrested, and convicted and put away, right? We, we are in a wonderful time where a lot of rights are being, a lot of wrongs are being righted, pardon me. 500 years of brutality and murder and rape and uh, uh, pillaging of wealth and resources, I see with our BCE students people who want to fix that. But you think about these ideas of black people, women, uh, the LGBTQ community, Asian, Latino, Muslims, Hindu, where do you most of the times get that idea? From the arts. It's from a movie. It's from a play. It's in a book. So if you use that, that power, your alchemy, your, your power of an alchemist for good, you can change perceptions of that have been held for half a millennium, 500 years, right, that people didn't understand. People would call me subhuman, thought my, my cranium was different than some other people's in this room. My cognitive ability were down in this sort of uh, uh, Ibram Kendi talks about in Stamp from the beginning. Wicked, wicked thoughts. But then you put a Sidney Poitier out there, right? You put a Denzel Washington, and even then the hardest racist is like, perhaps, perhaps, this racist argument is not going to fly, right? Uh, even today, this year with Coda, right, that won the Oscar. How, think about to yourself when, when, when you, hopefully when you're processing uh, this talk I'm giving to you, 
How many people had a perception about the hearing impaired before they, they clicked the Apple Plus logo? And then how many people's perception changed of the hearing prepared once the credits read? Tell me that's not magic. Tell me that's not power. That, and now are walking and seeing somebody with a hearing aid, and now there's empathy, where there may have been ridicule 10 years ago, maybe a year ago, six weeks ago, maybe two weeks ago, there would be ridicule. And now there is love and there is empathy. This is the magic that I'm trying to change our little magicians and our little alchemists to manage and contain and hopefully do right uh, and push the conversation forward in the world, that whatever that injustice is being done, whatever story is not being told, whatever population is not being employed, we could fix this, right, at the BCE, because we understand the magic and we understand the ground. We are the alchemists. We are Santiago um, uh, in, in, in the book, The Alchemist. And again, not to reveal too much, but how important this is to me, there's a line, and I have it tattooed right on my arm, but there's a line that Jay Electronica says. He says, sometimes like Santiago, at crucial points of my, of my novel, my only logical option was to transform into the wind. And when you are in that power, and anybody who's read The Alchemist know the scene that he's referring to, but sometimes the situation may cause, and you may have to tap into that power and do things that to the average person seem impossible. But I've done the impossible many times. I've worked with the impossible many times. I've worked with people who have done the impossible. The impossible means we just haven't quite figured it out, which is why we have to stay curious. So... Um, Thank you all for, for listening uh, to me. Thank you all for putting this together. Uh, thank you to uh, Dr. Brent Smith, the chair of our department, who provides the foundation for me to do my own alchemy and all of our faculty in the BCE. I think this is a wonderful program, unique, unlike any others. And we, uh, I say without hyperbole, are here to change the world. Peace. Join us on a pilgrimage to Limburg, Netherlands, to a restored 14th century medieval castle located in the small bucolic village of Well. For some of us, this is a trip down memory lane, a chance to relive our Emerson semester abroad, and this time share it with family and friends. For others, it's an opportunity to experience a curated, personalized cultural tour of this region of the Netherlands Mark your calendars for August 26th through 30th, 2023, and join us on this excursion that is sure to delight. Visit emerson.edu slash alumni to secure your spot. This trip is not to be missed. <laughs>